Dear brothers and sisters in Ukraine, what a joy to be with you, even though I can't be with you in person. It's a joy to do this video recording. And we're doing this video recording in November on my visit. And right now we're in the Shikovitska Church. This is a place with a lot of memories. We first came here in 1998 when uh, I was, when everything was new. I, I didn't know anyone, I didn't know Kiev, I didn't know Ukraine, but I came to see if um, we could maybe make a visit with a choir the year later in May. And we did come in May 1999, and that was the beginning of a wonderful time together with all of you here in Ukraine. It's been a joy to teach here, it's been a joy to work with you, it's been a joy to write um, insights, for instance, the biblical insights on worship that we have in the Telegram series, which are translated into Ukrainian and Russian. This is a very special place for me by now. But there's also a common, we also have common roots. Um, my father was born in the Ukraine, in um, the area of the Molochna colony, it was a Mennonite colony in uh, east of Zaporozhye. He left Ukraine, though, in 1925. His father died here, or my grandfather died in Ukraine of typhus, typhus, and uh, his uncle was shot on the field to the bandits. And so he left everything behind together with his mother and uh, brothers and sisters and came to Canada. When I think of the history of the Mennonites who stayed and the history of the Ukrainians here in the country, and, you know, you, we all know parts of the story the people being moved to the eastern part of um, Russia and so forth. It's a common story of suffering. But you know, there's one thing that I've learned from the story, the stories of the Mennonites, and especially from your stories, is that challenges are seen as opportunities. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how often something that seems to be hopeless or seems to be despair is something that you view as an opportunity. It's a lesson I've learned and it's a lesson that I'm trying to apply. And I hope that's a lesson that we can apply during this time. You know, music ministry is always very challenging. It doesn't matter that it's as challenging like it has been in the last two years, but it's, it's always challenging. And we, who are responsible for choosing the songs that people sing, have a big responsibility. You know, it's said that if you want to know somebody's theology, church's theology, just look at the songs that they sing. And, you know, sometimes the songs that we sing have a greater influence on what people believe about our faith, about doctrine, than the pastor. Now, we wouldn't like to think that. We'd like to think that the spoken word is the most effective. But, of course, songs have this ability to take the message with us. We take the message with us, and then we remember it. And as a result, it can have a very powerful, long-lasting impact. Now, every song, it contains truth. You know, every one of you, every time that you choose a song, you are a teacher of theology. You are a teacher of truth. Really, you are a preacher. Now, you may not think that way, but that doesn't change the fact that that's what you are. You are teaching and you are preaching through every song that you choose. And in John chapter 4, Jesus told the Samaritan woman that God is looking for true worshipers. And he said that true worshipers are those who worship in spirit and in truth. And part of uh, worshiping in truth means that it's biblical truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. Now, there is no alternative. You can't be a true worshiper and not worship with truth. So if you want to be involved in leading others in true worship, the theology, the content, the truth of the songs is very important. Now, every one of us faces two challenges in our ministry. One challenge is teaching theology through the songs, and the other challenge that we have is to maintain unity. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that we are to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Some people think we create unity. We don't create it. Our job is to maintain it. 
We don't want to destroy the unity that God has already created. So today, in this big responsibility that we have, I want to talk to you about these two challenges. Helping the Father find true worshipers who worship in spirit and truth, and maintaining unity, or as I sometimes say, don't destroy God's precious unity because of your own selfish actions. Now, to help our church, our church has the same challenges you do. The Canadian church, the North American church, the German church, the Albanian church, every church has the same challenges. To meet those challenges, I've developed a booklet for our congregation, and it's entitled Choosing Songs That Glorify God, Unify, and Edify. And today I would like to share two topics from that booklet with you. Now, it's our prayer that by the early part of 2022, this booklet will also appear in the Russian and Ukrainian language. But for today, two things. Three things that you need to know so that you can avoid unnecessary tension and conflict. And secondly, criteria for the songs that you choose. So, what do you need to know? The graphic that appears on the screen indicates that you need to know three things. You need to know the congregation or the group that you work with. You need to know the songs that you are singing. And thirdly, you need to know yourself. Now, this graphic shows the big picture, and it shows how these three circles overlap. And right there in the center, where these three circles overlap, is the place of what I've called in the English language, smooth sailing. It's the place where there's a minimum amount of tension and conflict. It's the place of harmony and work to, working together. It's the place where we don't have all these storms. It's the place where the waters become quite smooth and calm and we can work together. So what should you know about your congregation? Well, you should know your, your church's concerns about doctrine, about music styles, about associations. You need to know what they consider to be really, really important. We would say even sacred. What, what are the things that they will guard carefully? And what should you know about the songs that you sing? Well, you should know about the content of the song. You should know who wrote the song. You should know the conditions under which you wrote the song. You should know what other people think about the song, uh, their views. And, and then you should know how that matches up with the congregation. And what should you know about yourself? Well, you should know your own weaknesses and your own strengths. Make it a priority for yourself to study the theological foundations of worship and music. Make spiritual maturity a priority. So let's look very briefly at these two groups that you will find and exist on the graphic. First of all, know your congregation and know yourself. You know, it's very simple. If you are spiritually mature and your congregation is spiritually mature, you're going to work well together. You will have the wisdom, you will have the resources, you will have the skills to deal with the tensions. It doesn't evaporate the tensions. The tensions don't go away. The conflicts don't go away. The misunderstandings don't go away. But spiritually mature congregations and spiritually mature leaders can work it out. And that's what we want to be able to do. So you need to know about your congregation, about their past, about their tastes, what kind of instruments do they think are appropriate? What kind of music styles do they think they are appropriate? Which are not appropriate? And then you need to know what to do about it. You need to know yourself, too, and whether you are spiritually mature. So let's think about, too, about the congregation and yourself. We've talked about that being in harmony. What about congregation and songs? Well, if you know the songs well, you know music style, you know associations, you know who wrote it and things like that, and you know what kind of things are likely to distract the congregation from receiving the message, then very simply, you can choose better songs. And you also need to know yourself and the songs. You know, sometimes we just make choices because we like something, and, and we make choices not because it's the best thing for the congregation, or the group, or the young people that we're working with. We make choices because we think it's the best for ourselves. So we need to also know who we are and why we are doing the things 
that we do. We could do a, a lot more in talking about that, but now I'd like to talk about filters for songs. How do we remove weaknesses, false teaching, distractions from the songs, or how do we prevent these filters from a clogging up? There's going to be a, there's a graphic on the screen that you can look. You know, our goal is to present a song and then have it accepted by the congregation. Our duty is to remove anything from that song that would prevent the congregation from accepting it. If we don't remove the distractions, they will not accept it. And we go through a five-step process. First step may just seem very obvious and easy to you. But just asking the question of who is going to sing it, where are they going to sing it, and when are they going to sing it. As an example, a youth group sings a song for an evangelistic outreach. It's a powerful song of emotion, lots of drive, lots of power, and it very well accepted in that context. And then because of shortage of time and because the song is well known, it's uh, um, performed or sung at a communion service. And there's conflict, there's clash. It, it's just not the right place. Or a song that's appropriate for children might not be a song that's appropriate for older people and vice versa. So. That's a question just to ask right at the beginning, and I'm amazed at how many times that simple question is just not asked. Secondly, we look at text, and you know what we do? We take the text of that song, we don't listen to it, we don't listen to the recording of the song, we put the text on paper, look at just the words by themselves. You know why? Well, two reasons. First of all, the Bible doesn't talk a lot about music, um, style, and so we don't want to get distracted with that. And secondly, it's because so often, and this has been repeated so many times in my life, we fall in love with the music. We fall in love with the song because of the style, because of who's singing it, where it's being sung, the lighting, the drama, but the text isn't that good. But because we've fallen in love with that song, what happens? We try to justify why we should sing that song. And then we argue. We argue about things that we shouldn't even be arguing about. So we look at the text by itself, and then we ask ourselves some questions. And these questions are found in Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, Ephesians 5, 15 to 21. And I've read, you've already heard the title of our booklet. And so here's three very simple but very powerful questions. Does the text glorify God? Does the text build up those who are listening? Does it edify them? And thirdly, does it unify those who are singing or does it cause tensions among the group? And why? It's not enough to say it does that. You have to be able to say why it does that. You need to be able to give proof. And it would be really good if you could give biblical proof and say, this song teaches or unifies or edifies because of this biblical text. I often tell the people that are leading that they should be prepared after the service to give a short, concise, biblical answer as to why they chose the song. You know, if somebody comes up after the service and says to you, why did you choose that song? I didn't like that song. You should be able to just very calmly, lovingly be able to say, this song glorified God, or this song had a biblical teaching that is important for the congregation, and here's the verse that this song talks about. And then, very simply, are the lyrics clear and understandable? You know, some songs have words that, um, we, uh, that are not understandable. Maybe they're old words, or maybe they're modern, real cool words. Uh, so sometimes they need to be explained, and that's important too. Well, third step, and here's where the tensions come very often. What about the music style? And before we talk about music style as a whole, maybe a, just a very simple question. Can people sing the song? Are the songs in their range? You know, sometimes there's this fantastic tenor 
or this high soprano, and they choose a song because they love their voice way up, right? And that's where their voice is strong and beautiful. And then all the people are, ah, I can't sing it. Or it's too low. So just the range itself is very important. And does the melody, the rhythm, the vocal range, and the interaction allow for the congregation to sing? Sometimes we fall into the trap of turning our singing time into a concert. If you are leading and you're looking out and the people are not singing, then there's something wrong, especially if it's a time when we are to sing together. Now, any appropriate music style will support. It'll highlight the message that you've already decided is there. Um, but, you know, you need to be careful because there's the message of the text. But a music style brings with it something that's very important. It brings with it a mood. It brings it with it an emotion. These are very important. But sometimes the mood and the emotion have a different message than the text. And then we have a conflict. So you have to be very careful and make sure that the music style actually reinforces that, that message that you have. It makes the message more powerful. It should not have its own message. And you know, any part of a music style can be linked to a worldview, to an emotion, to special memories, to personal experiences, or biblical teaching. The response can be positive, it can be negative. It can be because of the rhythm, it can be because of the tempo, it can be because of the instruments, it could be because of the lighting that you have, it could be the way you are dressed, the way you behave. And suddenly, when that uh, one component appears, people are suddenly distracted because they're thinking of a worldview, or they're thinking of a past experience. And sometimes that's positive, sometimes that's negative. It can lead to conflict or acceptance, and suddenly generations and different groups are, are set apart. They're, they're in conflict. For some, the music style contradicts the message, and they say, I won't accept the message. And for others, the music style says, oh, this is authentic, this is relevant, this is for today, this is my culture, this is who I am, and I will accept the message. So, you can see whether that, where there's a challenge there. Well, the challenge is not new. The early church fathers experienced the same thing. And let's look at three verses which are really helpful for us. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? the common good. So, God gives us skills, He gives us abilities. We're supposed to use it for what? For the common good. No, not for our good, not for the good of our family, not for the good of our friends, not for the good of the worship team. Uh, it's for the common good. And that, what does that mean? <laughs> that means that sometimes we just need to sacrifice our own desires. And when we look at worship, worship is all about sacrifice. So, sometimes that's a, that's a simp simple way to provide unity and to uh, resolve the tension that exists in what I've just been talking about. Secondly, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26 just makes that a little bit more specific. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. And what does he, he say? Let all things be done for building up. So the question we ask ourselves is when there are differing opinions, are we building up the body of Christ, the congregation? If not, we need to make some changes. <clears throat> and then 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 33, a well-known passage, and I love the way it starts here, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. <laughs> I think that's the, the same thing in music. We could say maybe not all music styles and all music is uh, lawful, but a lot of it is. There's a lot of variety and flexibility, but, but not everything is good. And what does Paul say? Do everything to the glory of God. So, the fourth thing then is just to think practically about origins and associations of the song. 
Does the song have any known questionable sources or associations that may distract from the intended purpose of the song? And there's many things that, that could be the case there. But the bottom line is this, my brothers and sisters, if you sing a song in which the majority of the congregation is distracted because of an association, then you're failing to do your duty. You're failing to fulfill your calling. Fifthly, and finally, think about how the song is introduced. What are you doing with it? Sometimes people they check the text and they check the music style and they do all their research and they know their congregation and they know themselves and they know the songs and they've done all this work, but then when they present it, something goes wrong. So you need to think about how a new song is introduced, how it is sung. You know, sometimes people don't accept something because of, not because of the song, but because of who you are. Sometimes Songs are not accepted because of our own personal testimony or the testimony of someone in the group, uh, the maturity. Sometimes it's not accepted because of volume, because of tempo, because of clothing, because of what we wear, because of the stage presence and how we act and how we behave or the instruments. There's so many things. So really think carefully about that part. And finally, think about your own spiritual maturity and character. When Paul talks about the uh, maintaining the unity. It's interesting, he talks about three things. You should have humility, you should have gentleness, and you should have patience, bearing one another in love. Some people think that gentleness means weakness. You know, there's only two people in the Bible that are described as being gentle, Jesus and Moses. And I think you'd agree with me, they weren't exactly weak people. So we need to do all of this with humility, gentleness, and patience. So let me close with a quick review. You are called to maintain the spirit, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, and you are called to teach good theology. So take the time, and it takes time, take the time to know your congregation, to speak with them, to listen to them, take time to do the research on the songs, and take time to know yourself. Take time to build your own spiritual maturity. Take time to pray and to read God's Word. And then send all the songs through five filters. Who and where and why is it going to be sung? Analyze the text. Think about music styles and its effect. Think about associations. And finally, think about how you present it and who you are and who the team is and their character and their presentation. It's my prayer that when people talk about a time of singing that you've been leading, they would walk away and they wouldn't talk about, oh, wow, uh, that, that saxophone player was so amazing, or the band played uh, so incredibly well together with such tight ensemble, or awesome lighting, or all the emotions. They would walk away and they say, what a precious time of glorifying God. I feel like I'm connected now to my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And I have been spiritually edified. I've been built up spiritually. I feel like I'm more mature. I feel like I'm more prepared to face what I'm going to face this week. So I wish you God's power. I wish you God's joy. And I wish you God's blessing in your ministry. Thank you.